good afternoon good evening participants so today we are having the last day of uh, this program on machine learning for computer vision 2021 you know that we have been many of you may be knowing that we have been running programs on machine learning and deep learning uh, with uh, focus on computer vision so today uh, you already know uh, about uh, today's speaker, Dr. Santosh Viparthi. Dr. Santosh Viparthi, as you know, is an expert in the field of computer vision image processing. And he has done some excellent work on change detection uh, using uh, state of the art. Uh, he has created new algorithms and models for change detection and many more things related to computer vision. He's from MIT Jaipur and he is the joint principal coordinator of the program. <laughs> and I don't go into details. You already have um, known him for the last 12 days now. So I request uh, Dr. Santosh Viparthi to please deliver his lecture. After this, immediately after this, we'll be having our valedictory program from 6.30. So please stay tuned and we will be having our valedictory program, that's all. After that, you will have to give a final quiz at 9 p.m. from 9 to 9.40. Please try to submit your quiz before 9.40. Otherwise, I will keep receiving this mail that you were not able to submit. Thank you. Madam, my screen so is visible. Yeah. Madam, it's my pressure. madam. Always a pleasure, yes, please. <laughs> Madam, we are your students, we are inspiring. Uh, with your uh, teachers like you only, we are learning. I'm really happy, but I'm a little scared again, as usual, in front of you. Uh, good afternoon, participants. So, today we would like to discuss the concept on change detection, moving object detection. So here, if you can able to see the title itself, moving object detection. So we would like to detect only the moving objects. So the concept of this moving object detection is little different than the object detection, the popular techniques of object detection. So our uh, main object to here is, as I, as I told you that the name itself is a change detection. So we would like to identify where the changes were there in a particular given video sequence. Because from a given in a single frame, it will be difficult for us to identify the change because it, it is a static response. But if we can able to see a sequence of frames in a particular video, then there is a possibility to identify the motion that is called change, where in which particular frame the changes were there with respect to the previous frames. So by taking this particular small intuition as a reference. And we will go to discuss on this particular entire concepts of moving object detection. And our main motto of this particular moving object detection in today's lecture is to give a brief understanding about the uh, in the traditional approaches, how the researchers have solved the problem. But comes to a deep learning strategies, when, whenever the deep learning got popular, how the researchers have started solving a problem of the change detection and what was the limitations and how to overcome those limitations and so on. These are the things we would like to discuss on present discussion. So as I told you, moving object detection or a change detection. So here you can able to see in a particular uh, uh, sample uh, video clip here, the left side is the original sequence and the right side is a, you can able to see a responses in black and white, right? So this is, this is what we would like to, or we need to uh, detect or we need to, estimate how we can able to do so because the right side if you can able to see it here this is a pixel uh, binary segmentation based pixel wise binary segmentation strategy which is which is adopted here to solve this particular problem and the concept of this change detection 
can be called as a fundamental task of many of the computer vision operations. Many computer vision operations or computer vision tasks, this change rotation concept can be considered as a preliminary step or a fundamental step. So we can uh, uh, we can discuss some of the applications as well with respect with, with by considering some of the research articles. As I told you, this is the binary classification of each pixel as a foreground or a background. So you can able to see here in the literature, we have the researchers have solved this particular problem in two different ways. You can able to see it here. The first one, I hope you are able to see. Yeah, this is the first one you can able to see it here. This is also we are trying to identify the changes with respect to the bonding boxes. But if you'll observe in the background, there is a snowfall. I hope you are able to see it on this particular uh, thing. <clears throat> yeah. So you try to you try to observe this particular clip here. Here in the background, there is a snowfall. This is also one type of a change in a particular video sequence. But the algorithm is able to identify the actual changes only. Now comes to this particular middle one. You can able to see it here. This is also a moving object rotation because clearly you can able to observe here. There are some uh, there are some uh, cars from an aerial view. They are static. So these algorithms are not detecting the static objects, but these algorithms are able to detect in the move moving objects. So this is another uh, another challenging task from an aerial view. The third one is as we already know, this is a popular technique. This is called a binary classification based moving object detection. So this is also possible and this is also possible and we'll go to discuss these both the solutions in, present, in today's presentation and what are the limitations or challenges on this particular strategy and what are the advantages of these strategies we're going to discuss. Now before going to see about this change reduction, there are major challenges are there and there are some basic steps we need to follow. What was the first step? The first step in a change rotation is estimating a background. First of all, we need to estimate from a given video what type of a background particular video contains. So first step is background estimation. And the second step is saliency estimation. Motion saliency estimation is nothing but now once I have estimated a background from a set of sequence of frames, now I need to check whether it, whether the current frame is having any of the motion or not so let me simplify the things in a simplest manner let's assume you have a hundred frame sequence a small video is there it is having hundred frames so initially you have taken a 20 frames that is called a set of 20 frames from this 20 frames you have estimated a background now from 21st frame onwards you are trying to check with respect to this background is there any changes are there or not in the 21st frame because if there is a if there is any emotion when are you trying to take the difference between the current frame and the previous background model you can able to you can able to see the changes if, if both are same the difference will be same that's called black right so if you can able to find out any of the variation that is called saliency estimation so the saliency can be possible that the information can be preserved or you can be able to see whenever there is a motion in it okay let's assume now let's assume the third last one is foreground segmentation once once i have done the sales motion sales estimation the next step will be for is foreground segmentation so that is what i have shown you that the each and every pixel way each and every pixel in a given image we need to calculate whether the bottle given pixel is a foreground or a background with the by by considering some thresholding value from threshold value so the overall concept of this change relation will follow these three two steps background estimation salience estimation and foreground segmentation <clears throat> these are some challenges uh like right now we are not going to discuss on it and uh, some aerial views we're going to discuss the solutions later now what the challenges were there what the challenges are there in a conventional view because if you can able to try to solve the problem from the aerial view we have a different challenges let's let's go for the con uh, traditional approaches or the conventional view scenarios then whatever the challenges generally we used to face while developing any of the algorithm 
the first one is moving of the duration in different weather conditions we will going to see this the first thing here is camera jitter what is the meaning of a camera jitter now you can able to see it here this is a t frame this is a t plus one frame right this is a current frame the camera jittering is nothing but the data acquisition device that is a camera itself is little shaking because of the external impact so the camera that is while while capturing the data it itself is little shaking so it can it will create a one type of a, a motion in a particular frame but actually it's not a true motion so you can able to see it here in the red color bounding box you can able to see it here here and here whenever you are trying to take the difference between these two you will not get the zero you will going to get some non zero value because the input device itself is little shake uh, there is a small change uh, moment in the image uh, data acquisition device you can able to feel there is a change but actually there is not a true change this is another interesting and very quite common problem that is called dynamic background let's assume you have a uh, standing in front of the lake on other side there is a some good scenery is there or the vehicles are moving on other side in between there is a fountain you can able to see the fountain here i hope you are able to see the fountain here but if you can able to see as the time goes on the t plus t frame and the t plus one frame you can able to see in the t t frame the, the momentum of the, the motion of the fountain will be there and t plus one frame also the changes will be there because the fountain will go up and come down right the water flow will be there towards upside and downside so there is a moment but on the back side if you can able to see the true moments are a vehicle you can able to see the vehicle here it is it is varying it is, it is moving towards one direction at a particular speed now the question will come here is which one is a true one which one is a background which one is a foreground if the fountain is even though it is a changing even though it is a varying or it is giving a it is giving an impression of a change but actually it is not a change this particular moment of a uh, this particular uh, fountain is belongs to a background rather than a foreground but here the vehicle moment is comes under background now here the challenging will come here is how you can able to make your algorithm to understand that these are all the changes are re related to the foreground or this much of the changes are related to the background so there means there should be some strategy to filter it out some extent of changes that means the variation will belongs to for uh, background so this is one uh, quite, uh, quite common problem in uh, uh, change relation this is also another quite quite uh, common problem illumination changes here you can able to see it here the illumination changes as the time goes on maybe in the evening time slowly we would like okay so here you can able to see this uh, changes here in the evening in the evening time in our, in our offices we will try to off the lights but generally we will not going to off the lights all together at once right so we'll go to off the lights one after other so whenever in during the particular time the illumination change that means the lightning condition will going to give uh, give a one type of an illusion because when i will go to take the difference between the two frames again you will get the difference because in the previous frame of each frame you can able to see the lighting conditions are different and t plus 20th frame light lighting conditions are different t plus uh, t plus 10th frame the lighting conditions are different but whenever you are trying to take the subtraction between these two, simple subtraction I'm talking about, when I'm going to take the difference between these two frames, definitely you're going to get the change. But this change is not a motion. There are some changes. Definitely, the as time goes on, the pixels are going to be varied, uh, the pixel intensities are going to be differ from location to uh, from time frame to time frame. So we need to consider about these things also. Like uh, these changes are because of the lightning, not because of the actual motion. This is a, another interesting and difficult problem that is called the camouflage. Your foreground and background will look similar. Both will have the same color. Then how you can able to identify there is a object. You can able to see here the person which is standing in front of the door. And you can able to see here a flight in the, air in the airport, the background and the object which is in the green color. So you can able to see it here. Both are, background sometimes is dominating the object color. It will be very difficult for algorithm to identify 
you know whether the object is there or not so if the object itself detection is a difficult then how we can able to identify there is a motion so another one is weather conditions is quite quite common problem that especially in the north india during winters so the flights are getting delayed and flights are getting delayed and recently uh, from IIT Roorkee, there was a patent. They, they filed a patent, U.S. patent, in uh, haze removal, and some of the researchers from uh, IIT Roorkee is also working on the similar thing and the haze removal. And they have done some consultancies. You can you can go through the, I mean, more details about the haze in uh, in in IIT Roorkee and IIT Roorkee. Shadow, shadow is a shadow is a very quite common problem because whenever you will uh, during the. Um, uh, while while you are trying to walk during a depending upon the lightning conditions you can able to feel the shadow shadow also will going to move shadow also will create create an impression of a another person so now we need to develop an algorithm in such a way that these changes are related to the background it is not the actual true foreground this is also another uh, challenging condition and night vision uh, night vision is also another uh, challenging condition where you you cannot able to even properly able to see particular object because of the he heavy lights so intermittent objects sometimes the uh, movements are very slow uh, for a particular time span it will be moves very slowly again it will go very fast so the intermittent object motions like if you if you will go in a uniform speed it will be easy for the um, uh, algorithm to detect but it will go very slow or very fast again we're going to create a confusion so we need to handle this intermittent object motions as well and there are some other challenges turbulence bigger moving mo moving objects and so on now if you can able to consider this change detection from a aerial scenes till now we have discussed on the uh, convention that means there is a cc camera from the cc camera what the changes we can able to see we have discussed now if you can able to think from an aerial view we have some different type of challenges the same challenges will not be here. The titles might be same, but the way of seeing the problems are a little different. Now you can be able to see it here. In the conventional views, the size of the object will be very bigger. But in this, from the aerial view, see the size of the object is very tiny size, very small. In other words, we can be able to say here, in a conventional view, the object size, the in a in a particular frame. The particular object may occupy the size of a frame of maybe 200, 100 cross 100 pixels. Let's assume. Suppose you have a 200 cross 200 frame, out of which maybe 100 cross 100 frames or 50 cross 50. Uh, uh, the size of the object will be 50 cross 50. But if you can able to analyze the same problem from the aerial view, here the object will occupy only the size of maybe 7 cross 7 or 10 cross 10. So you can able to see how much of that uh, tiny objects is there. You can able to clearly able to see from these uh, figures. Now you, you, you can able to see this particular uh, black dots, whether it is an object, whether it is a car or whether it is a pit on the road. If it is Indian scenario or entire roads will from aerial, if you can able to capture, everything is looks like an object only because everywhere you have a pits. Now occlusions of uh, trees, night vision, is also common problems from the aerial view. These are all the things we need to consider. First, the challenging is how you can able to detect the tiny objects. Now, and another problem is these objects. So you can able to see it here in the conventional view. You have very limited number of objects in a particular frame, but here in the aerial view, you can able to see you, you will going to see a number of objects here. I hope you are able to see it here. You will have a number of objects. So this is another challenging problem how we can able to detect a number of uh, objects in a single frame because it will have different different uh, sizes the size of the uh, car will be different and the size of the truck will be different the size of the ship will be different so depending upon what type of an uh, algorithm we are trying to apply or how, what type of the uh, classification strategy uh, sorry how many different type of classes we are going to consider based on that the algorithms are going to be dependent and the solutions are going to be dependent you can ask one question that in a, in a conventional view, you, you have developed one good algorithm and it may it may not going to work on the aerial view and vice versa. That is the reason now in the recent in the uh, in the literature recently, the uh, researchers are trying to develop a uniform algorithm which can be going to handle on the tiny objects as well as the bigger objects. So if that algorithm is able to uh, work perfectly, then we can able to use this single concept for both aerial and 
conventional together. So let's let's go for the traditional approaches. In the traditional approaches, the change reduction is done in these ways. First, we need to extract the features. So feature extraction, we have different different strategies: color features, texture features, spatial features, temporal features, and so on. Then background to be model that is called background initialization and background maintenance because we need to maintain a background because 20th frame in, i told you already 100 100 frame sequence uh, one particular video clip is having 100 frames out of which 20 frames you have considered and you estimated a background 21st frame you are taking the difference between the estimated background then you are analyzing in a 21st frame is there any changes are there is there any movements are there or not Let's assume there is there are some changes, then 21st frame will be will be having some foreground information. Suppose there is no changes, then what about this 20th frame? Because you need to estimate the 22nd frame also. That time we need to update this background. Every time we need to update our background model because now initially 20 it is okay. As time goes on, this particular background model also need to be updated. Therefore, for every current frame, you can able to check with the updated background models. It indicates that the older frames, if you consider as a background, so you can neglect it. There's no point in keep every time keeping the old frames. So every time we need to maintain our background models so that you can able to get the proper foreground detection. So that was a, that was the reason we need to initialize those background. Then we need to maintain the backgrounds. So once the backgrounds are over, once this particular background modeling is over, then we need to go for the foreground detection. As I told you that feature extraction can be done in different different uh, strategies are there in the literature. The background modeling also there are different different strategies also present: parametric model, non-parametric model, clustering, and so on. For the foreground detection also, we have a classification and threshold models are available on the in the traditional approach as well. In a conventional strategies, we have this particular concepts which are already present if you if anybody interested to knew the detailed change relations uh, survey or the detailed knowledge of the change detection till 2017 you can refer this particular concept of uh, uh, transaction paper here they have considered all the conventional strategies what type of the approaches they have allowed or what the, how many different types of strategies were there in the literature this is a review paper extensive benchmark and survey of modeling methods for scene background initialization which got accepted in 2017 in tip so there they have clearly mentioned about the pixel level methods what is the meaning of pixel level methods there are, we can able to solve the problem in different ways one is let's assume i have a uh, frame size of uh, m cross n you knew this previous collection of a pixels you can take a decision on each and every pixel also. So this mostly wide implementation methods, they have used the pixel methods. In this case, we need to process each and every pixel level because you need to take a decision on pixel level. There is another strategy that is called region level methods. So you have already, we have already discussed in the previous classes that neighborhood operations, some group of pixels, instead of trying to take a decision on a single pixel, you can take a group of pixels that is called a three cross three or five cross five, some local region. Then you can able to take a decision. So if you're going to able to use this uh, region level pixel, you can able to get the interpixel relationships. You can get you can get advantage of this interpixel relations. What type of relations are there between the pixels? But of course, yes, region level approaches will going to take the little high complexity. There are some another strategies over there. They have used both region uh, hybrid methods that is called pixel as well as the region level they have used these two concepts together to solve the problems so what are the advantages and disadvantages there in the previous two things we, we can cover these two in the hybrid approaches Sim, uh, similarly there are some other approaches are there interactive model com uh, completion that is called construction of the background images is an iterative manner identify areas Similarly, missing data reconstruction. You can able to reconstruct the missing data. This is also one type of a, another. There are some researchers, they have solved this problem in this way also. You can predict. Okay, right now there is there is a background, there is a, a moment. After some extent, 
do the vehicle will going to move or not that also we can do that so in the literature these are the things are available now there are some another approaches that is based on the real time perspective offline mode and online methods that means some of the methods are very lightweight and it can be used for the real time perspective some of the methods are very good in accuracy but not for real time so you can be used for the post processing the once the data is generated then you can able to analyze coming to this this deep learning the change reduction strategies is people have tried to solve using deep learning in different different ways because the concept of the cnn models initially popular for the classification models but not for this uh, motion identification or not for this particular change reductions but but reviewers uh, in the researchers started using this ability of deep learning or cnn models in this particular field also so there are different type of ways the researchers have used to solve the problem you can able to see it here now in this particular thing the way you are going to feeding the data to uh, data to a network will going to play a role so some of the uh, some of the researchers have used only sequence of frames as it will be like a sequence of 5 frames 20 frames 50 frames and so on now out of uh, out of t frames you can give a subset of t frames don't give the 50 out of this you you give only limited <laughs> there are some there are some uh, different type of algorithms you try to ex use the conventional approaches first you try to extract some backgrounds with the help of mean or median then you feed this background information to the network so that it can able to properly learn These, there are some algorithms which are uh, uh, freely computed the background and feeding to the network there are some uh, another type of uh, research article that is called only the current frame you can able to create pass no need to pass the entire uh, frame sequence there are some algorithms only current frame you can able to pass then you can able to estimate so if you can able to see uh, in this particular concept of uh, deep learning they are using this uh, encoded decoder concepts because classification is something like this you have an input size of m cross n but ultimately you are trying to take the decision on classes one two three four so once you will down sample the data once you reach to the fully connected layers you are passing for the losses softmax layer and you are estimating the what type of class it belongs to but it comes to this encoder decoder here the object is suppose my image size is m cross n again i need an output also in m cross n because within that uh, within that uh, output i need to identify in which location the changes are there so your target is on a a complete you are identifying a motion in a again frame only so you need to maintain the sizes right so th that is the reason we are going to use this encoder decoder concepts now there is some of the articles they are using the gan concepts also in place of encoder simple encoder decoder so here uh, pretend rates also people have used to solve the problem capsule networks address convolution lstm and there are different uh, uh, ways they have used to uh, calculate this change reduction similarly for here we see in 3D C in and GAN auto encoder and many. Now, what are the publicly available data sets are there? CDNet 2014 data set is one of the popular data set for uh, traditional approaches. This particular data set is uh, first initially proposed in uh, 20, 2012. Later, they have added some initially for uh, it is having 53 videos, 13 categories. Initially, they have developed for the eight categories. Later, they have added the five categories in 2014. Now, there are some different different data sets also available for the change reduction. Underwater also we have, and thermal also we have. And the remaining are natural data sets. This is a proper uh, data divisions. How many number of videos are there in a particular uh, data set and how, how many labels are there and so on you can able to see the details clearly from here now in the change detection models or removing of detection we need to calculate the performances so there we need to go use this uh, evaluation of matrices that is called precision recall f score pwc fpr and so on so in this particular uh, strategies generally we will go for the f score because the f-score will, will go into cover the precision and recall all together. So the f-score is a more appropriate as compared to the precision and recall. 
same concept if you would like to solve a bounding boxes because change reductions can be done with the help of the pixel wise uh, segmentation also binary segmentation also or a bounding box also why we need to go for this type of strategies we will discuss at the, at the end so in if you are going to use the concept of bounding box based change reduction or moving object recognition or detection we need to calculate the performances with the help of iou intersection of over union because you are trying to calculate the, with based on the bounding boxes how much of the regions are overlapped to make you little uh, uh, comfortable in this particular flow of uh, actual concept of deep learning in through cnn where i i'm going to explain the simple concept of uh, uh, change reduction by solving one particular target that is called dynamic background subtraction so when wherever you have the dynamic background as i told you that then there is a fountain back uh, fountain fountain will going to create a confusion so fountain is one example of a dynamic background so how we can able to handle such type of problems this particular paper got accepted in icpr is international conference on pattern recognition if anyone interested in more details you can uh, go for here go to this particular paper so what this this i'll give you a brief uh, brief uh, idea about this particular paper how these particular concepts are different than the existing in the conventional approaches in traditional approaches this substance swipe and pbas are the very popular techniques you can able to refer any of the standard paper the substance and vibe are the basic methods people used to compare because they have used they have developed a very robust solutions of course there are some limitations as well now how these particular concepts are going to be involved or what are the things that are very important first one is whenever you are going to develop any of the algorithm we need to initialize the parameters so for this particular models this uh, popular techniques are vibe and substance and uh, pbas the initial parameters are manually they have designed the parameter values are fixed so if you change the if you going to change the video or a different a different data it may work it may not work that is when are we going to initialize the parameters manually it may be giving a robust solution for one particular problem only so in the particular uh, paper this uh, candidate the semi automated that is adapt to parameter initialization depending upon the type of a data the parameters can be updated or parameters can be initialized this is the first uh, contribution you can consider that the second one is background model update the background model update the vibe and substance they have used non deterministic strategies but in the candidate they have used deterministic pro deterministic strategies that means they knew what type of background mod model to be updated that means what type of addition to be taken in which particular pixel i need to make the change or in particular frame in which frame i need to make the changes or which frame can be considered as a old frame which which frame can be considered as a new frame so these type of uh, strategies they have proposed in this particular candidate operation the algorithms are sensitive to dynamic background yes the vibe is little sensitive to the dynamic backgrounds but substance is not sensitive and pbas is not sensitive and and it is also not sensitive what type of a dynamic update rate they have used so inspired from the substance we also developed the, we use the similar dynamic update strategy there are some different uh, things to to speed up the detection strategies for the real time perspective we have not used uh, i mean candid doesn't have used any color images or anything and local descriptors also not used that means the decisions are on the pixel wise only and neighborhood pixel background updates yes we also followed the same strategy of vibe and substance you can able to see this is a simple uh, uh, workflow so initially the temporal medians are extracted then change the dynamics to be estimated with the help of uh, background models that's called background model and current frame we can calculate the change change dynamics through this change dynamics we can uh, as i told you this is a change uh, dynamic update rate and dynamic threshold there are two different things we have introduced here it can automatically it has to update according to the properties it is not something like a rule that you have to update depending upon the frame depending upon the background depending upon the video the decisions to be taking taking care the same strategy like a background to be updated through that through this we have used some of the recent history what is a descriptor descriptor as a tool like how you can able to describe the features or how you can able to extract the features from a given data how you can able to represent this is the terminology called descriptor in the literature 
the strategy which you have followed to extract the features from a from a given data is called descriptive so then recent history models are five frames we have used based on this we can able to get the foreground detection and, and post logging is a very quite common processor so in details about these particular things you can uh, verify this particular paper this is a traditional approach that's why i'm not focusing more on it but i can show you this uh, some of the samples here so you can able to see it here this is the uh, original input after some you can able to see here focus on here there will be a car steadily change randomness what is the change randomness identify the changes are there or not so this is something like you for initially you calculate the median through median you can able to subtract the frames so definitely you will going to get that yeah you can able to see it here there is a vehicle here the vehicle movements are you can focus on here and here this is a ground truth and these are the results so change that means something is nothing that initially we can able to calculate the median temporal median you can initially take the 50 frames for the 50 frames you can calculate the median so median is something like you will going to get the background information because you are trying to take the middle value middle frame right now how you're going to take calculate the median here suppose you have a three frames how if let's go for the pixel number called one cross one location is one cross one in the first frame and second frame and the third frame at the same location you have to go for the median what are the median value will be there you pick it up put it on the new frame like that you have to apply for the same entire uh, images of three frames you will get a single median now for that median response you can separate from the all the current frames so in this example 50 frames we have considered others have considered calculate a single frame that is called median through median you can subtract so you can able to get the change dynamics initial change dynamics there you can able to see when are you trying to do this uh, simple concept of change dynamics the, the fountain information is still there here but you need to remove so in order to remove we have proposed some uh, recent history models and dynamic update rates and so on therefore after completion of the strategy you can able to see the, the information most of the information has lost but still there are some information is left this is the ground truth here you can able to see it here this is the ground truth these are some of the results this is a another uh, uh, what we call a descriptor based solution in this concept one new descriptor has proposed this is a antic antithetic isomeric cluster pattern this is a pattern based because in the substance and all they have considered the concepts of uh, neighborhood operations so that the problem can be interpixel relations can be considered so now the question will come here why only interpixel why can't we why only interpixel why can't we go for the interpixels so with this we have proposed one i mean sorry the other have proposed one um, concept that is called antic that is called antithetic isomeric cluster patterns this is this concept is useful for both the image retrieval as well as the change reduction strategies so you can able to go through this concept, concept of antic the main goal of this antic is to detect the line information and corner information the main uh, basic fundamental concept of this antic is you can able to get the lines directional based line information in you can able to identify in which direction what type of lines are what type of changes are there and corner information also you can able to identify with this particular strategy and these particular strategy uh, these particular features are failed in the popular techniques of lbp lmap and so on so this was the advantage of using this antic and comes to this uh, uses of antic in change reduction here inter and intra antic concepts have used because inter and here we need to take a decision between the frames right if it is a retrieval it is a single frame but in the uh, change reduction we need to use more than one frame therefore we have used the concept of inter and intra relations how you can able to take the inter and intra relations let's see here here let's assume t frame and t plus one frame you can able to answer at a particular location uh, at a particular uh, neighborhood location We'll consider the neighbors of the T plus one frame. You are trying to take the reference of the center center pixel of the current frame. So guys, are you able to follow here? Here I have two frames. One is at a T, another one is at T plus one frame. Now, what type of relation we are trying to take here? The relation is we I am considering the neighborhood of neighboring pixels of the T plus one frame. You are trying to take the relation between the neighborhood of the t plus one versus the center pixel of the current frame so 
the decision is in between the two frames it's not a single frame so i hope you are uh, somewhat clear on this so this is called inter now what was the advantage inter is also same thing inter means yes please intra means within the frame itself what about uh, what about uh, relation you would like to follow what was the advantage of using this particular concept of inter and intra so the advantage is here the advantage is you can able to see it here this is a background so this is a background representation so as i'm using a inter and intra total i will have inter will have eight eight responses intra i will get eight responses so when i will go to mix these two you will go to get the 16 responses so here i got the 16 responses because you knew the concept of lbp local binary pattern similar strategies we hear it in different ways now let's assume there is a shadow in this particular thing, there is a shadow you can able to see this location observe here observe here this is a shadow so for this shadow also you will also will apply the inter and intra concepts you will going to get the 16 pixels now you try to take the hamming distance between these two because in the background you knew that where, wherever the background will be there there one type of a re, so one type of a representation is there because i am trying to take the re, relations be, between the inter and intra concepts so i got 16 responses but wherever the shadow is there the variations at the shadow are little lighter as compared to the foreground so here you got the 16 responses you can take the hamming distance between these two you got the hamming distance is two here but you can able to see the foreground at the same location after some extent of time you can able to see the foreground here so just you come just you verify the foreground and the background here shadow here there are major changes will be there in the foreground so here the inter and inter pixel representations are something different now you try, try to take the now you try to take the hamming distance between these two here the distance is more as compared to shadow so you can able to consider uh, some threshold here in this example we have considered threshold of four if any of the hamming distance is greater than four you can able to we can we consider as a foreground otherwise it can be considered as a background so this particular concept of inter and intra mainly uh, focusing towards the shadows just for simple exam example it will this particular concept is going to solve uh, a number of other challenges also but this is this is one major uh, observation which we have i mean by keeping this observation in mind we have developed this particular algorithm more details about this you can uh, refer this particular paper and these are all the results now comes to this concept of deep learning it's very advanced techniques and everyone is interested in this now let's go for this particular concept of deep learning for moving object detection now what the major thing we need to consider here is the inconsistent training and testing data division schemes so the concept of change detection we will we will going to solve with the help of the deep learning concepts but the question here is, you need to observe here is what type of train what type of strategies we have adopted to solve the problem is very, is very important concept let's try to think about the in this way first independent independent strategies what we have claimed you can able to see this diagram before we're going to discuss about this slide of scene dependent and scene independent, let's recollect the concept of change detection in the conventional view. In the convention, in, in the traditional approaches, just you pass a particular video. What we used to do there? In suppose, let's say, assume you have a video frame is a thousand frames. Initially, fifty frames or x x number of frames you consider. Then you estimated a background. Once you have estimated a background n plus one frame onwards you are estimating whether the current frame is having a foreground or background information and you are repeating the same task till the end of the frame so during this particular procedure whatever the video you, you will give you to your algorithm it will going to give it will go you will try to estimate the foreground and background information so it doesn't require any of the you know uh, labels in the conventional approach so the basic change in concepts can be considered as a uh unsupervised learning strategies in the conventional but it comes to the cnn models in the cnn models these are all with we need some of the labels so it's a supervised learning now how we can able to solve the problem so researchers as in the beginning researchers has come up with various strategies the first strategy is 
SCN dependent data division. What is the mean, meaning of SCN dependent data division? Because it is not on a complete video, it is on a the CNN models need some input and it requires some labels also to train the to train the models, right? So some of the researchers have followed this strategy called scene dependent data division strategies. You can able to see it here. What is the meaning of scene dependent? So you see the meaning scene dependent, depending upon what? Now you can able to see the training data. This is one uh, category of a sofa, indoor indoor category. There is a sofa is one video set. Now in the training data, you can able to see the sofa as well as on the testing data, you can able to see the sofa. Similarly, you can able to see the snow. Snow data is there on the training as well as snow data is on the testing. Parking and park, sorry, uh, traffic and traffic and aerial view, aerial. You can able to see it here. The set of frames which are there in the training and similar type of data is available on the testing. It means that it, it doesn't mean that same frame is there. No, it's not like that. Let's assume you have a, a thousand frames in a particular video sample. You can you can divide the data into training and testing. Fifty percent for the fifty percent of the category will be belongs to the training and fifty percent is for the testing. But you need to observe one thing: during the training and testing, the background of these particular models are same. So this particular back, if you are maintaining a background concept state both in the training and testing, this is called scene dependent data division strategies. So which one is the best or somewhat robust or challenging? This is called scene independent data division. That means you are going to train some models on the training or select some models on the training, but during the testing, none of the frames of the training data or background is available. It should not be there. So you can able to see it here. Let's assume the case number one. One particular category is having four set of videos. You train the model on videos and you can test on the fourth video because the fourth video content directly or indirectly in is not at all involved in the training that means the training model not even seen such type of a data so this seen independent data division strategies are more suitable for the real time perspective this is a major major observation is required before applying any of the change relation strategies or algorithms Now with this we can we can say one thing that scene dependent may will always outperform than the scene independent because the background the training model have already seen what about the background it is so definitely you're going to get the better results so in the similar lines we have uh, we are we're going to discuss about one particular paper that is called uh, multi-scale deep saliency learning for moving object detection this paper got accepted in smc you see this particular strategy here see this strategy here it's very simple approach, but a very interesting problem because it was published in long back. It was published in 2018. That time, this uh, concept of change detection using the CNN models in the field of change detection is very new. So you can able to see it here. Here, set of frames I have. From here, manually you can able to est uh, estimate the backgrounds. That means by using this uh, median or mean, whatever you can able to estimate the background for every chunk. Here I'm here. The researchers have used the chunk group of frames as one chunk. For every chunk, they have calculated one median or frame background model, and the particular background model they have passed to one CNN model. So you can able to see it here. The first step is the saliency estimator, <coughs> background estimation to temporal histogram based method that is called conventional, that is called traditional. Saliency method generated with the pixel wise differences, then foreground segmentation using the Compact encoder decoder network. So initially they have used this uh, manual, they have utilized the first stage network, that is one stage with the help of a uh, temporal histogram, that is called median. They have in, in they have considered for the for the 50 friends. Then they have passed to the some simple encoder decoder network and they calculated this foreground. So they have used two stream network because to maintain some different scales. The scale is 5 12 cross 5 12, and here the scale is 256 cross 256. <coughs> So in this particular strategy, the manual interventions are involved. And they clearly mention about the limitation in the limitations as well. And the way they have divided the data also clearly mentioned in this particular paper. So here you can able to see the change rate 2014, as I told you, during the time, change rate is a major resource for solving a problem, but the concept of change rate is not for the CNN models. This is for the conventional uh, moving object detection strategies. 
to do that, we have used this change that data set. But researchers have tried to use this particular data set as a reference. So, how many number of frames are there? The season that he's having 18,000 some frames. And this particular frame, the researchers had divided into two parts. That is, 2,000 frames for the training and the rest of the frames for the testing. You can able to see it here. Total number of frames, they divided into two parts. One is for the training and the one is for the testing. And they have tested on the limited set of samples because that is a conference paper. They have they have shown their efficacy on the limited set of samples. So the limitation is it is limited set, and they have used a conventional approach also to train the model. To overcome this, the same others have proposed an end-to-end -end solution. But that means entire thing is on as CNN models only. The end-to-end -end solution. So, as per their claim in this particular paper, this is the first paper which proposed a complete end-to-end -end solution for the change reduction when we use the class fair. We will discuss this class fair whenever, whenever I'm going to discuss about this, the 3D CNN models on change reduction. I will explain this. So, as per the claim from these others, they have used the first end to end solution for change reduction. So, I'll, let's go for this particular network. Let's see this here. This is a complete network. So, as I told you, that first one is background estimation, saliency motion estimation, and foreground. These are the three steps which I have, which, which have followed, which are going to follow in the change reduction. Let's see this first, first one is a the researchers have developed a complete end to end solution for the background estimation. In the previous concept, they have used this temporal medium, right? For the 50 frames, they have uh, got the temporal medium. But in this example, they have generated a background. They have learned or estimated a background. How you can able to see it here? Initially, they have taken they have they have taken uh, 50 frames. The uh, the frame size is 256 cross 256. Initially, the the frames of 50, this one chunk of frames, they have they have uh, <clears throat> feed it to the network. From this particular 50 frames, they have calculated this temporal pooling. With the help of pooling operation, they have estimated the temporal pooling that is called averaging. Temporal average, that means that through this particular uh, CNN, they have estimated an average response. On this average response, they have done some convolution operations so that the background can be properly estimated. So what they have done, Initially, eight convolution operations they have used. Three cross, three cross, one cross, eight. It means that three cross three is a convolution operation. Here, the depth is one because it's a grayscale. Like that, they have used eight filters. So three cross, three cross, one cross, eight is nothing but three cross three is a mass size. One is a depth. Here, here they are using a grayscale channel. Sorry, channels. You can consider as a channels. Eight is a such type of operation 3 cross 3 cross 1 they have applied 8 so this is called 3 cross 3 cross 1 cross 8 so now they got 8 responses and they have used a max pooling here they have used uh, again got the 8 responses here the max pooling is nothing but it's not like a uh, spatial dimension reduction no it's not like that it's the max pooling with respect to one only they are maintaining the sizes only now, finally, they have used this concept of, uh, then they have estimated again a temporal pooling averaging concept. That means after this max pooling, they generated a single frame. This single frame they are considering as a three cross, three cross, one cross eight. Okay. This single frame they're considering as a background estimator because from a 50 frames, they, were they have estimated a temporal average, average pooling operation that is called temporal um, uh, frame they have estimated. On this, they have done the convolution operation because they can able to train them, they can able to uh, estimate the background through these uh, losses. For, further, they have used this uh, convolution operations here. 3 cross 3 cross 1 cross 8. So what is the meaning of 3 cross 3 cross 1 cross 8? 3 cross means 3 cross 3 convolution. Mask size. 1 is the grayscale, that is the channel is 1. 8 is nothing but like that, how many number of filters they have used. So in VGC 16 and all, they have used 64 filters, 32 filters, right? Similarly here, they have used only eight filters. Now, once the background is estimated, they need to calculate the saliency motion, right? How they have done the saliency motion, you can able to observe here. 
because this particular paper they have they have claimed that they have implemented through matlab so what are the single background they have estimated they replicated this single frame to 15 frames they they they, they, uh, they are termed as a replicate layer so single frame they repeated to 50 times because that time they don't have this uh, tool or they don't have any of the library to calculate this average pool so they have used some strategies through cnn models to calculate this temporal mode temporal pooling so the temporal pooling response is replicated to 50 times and they concatenated to original frames because they need to calculate the saliency response original frame one frame this uh, background model second frame background model third frame background model so here they have, they have constructed the 100 frames you can able to see it here <coughs> the replicated responses and the original features are concatenated together then they have done this particular differentiation so for the differentiation they have used differential layer differential layer will go to calculate the difference between the current frame and the background model that is called the difference once it is over because uh, <clears throat> once you will calculate the differences you will going to get the n number of differences so, so from there they have done the max pooling operation here the max pooling they have used this tried one only these max pooling operations they have feed it to encoder and decoder further they have calculated the round estimation during this entire procedure if you observe just you pass a input here you get the output here it will going to automatically create the backgrounds and so on so this is the first attempt as per the as per these others claim but what was the limitation here the limitation here is if you observe properly here they have passed the 50 frames as a chunk here so 50 frames means this entire algorithm for the 50 frames it is going to generate a single frame and so on right single background and so on so this particular algorithm will going to work for each and every 50 frames so to do that they have divided this data into uh, this i told you that for the global training and testing they have they have generated this uh, 653 SVS. SVS is nothing but uh, so you can consider this SVS is like a chunk. So you can able to see it here. 32,650 frames are there. They have selected uh, 32,650 frames from the CD net. Then from there, they have divided, just you divide this uh, 32,650 by 50, you will go to get the 653. So this 50, 653 can be considered as a ch one chunk. Like that, they have 653. Somewhere I missed the uh, SVS definition here. So SVS is, uh, yeah, you can consider this SVS is as a month chunk only. So he, during the training, they have uh, trained the models like this. Now the question here is, entire video sequence is there, you divide into 50 chunks. N number of frames divided by 50. You got the 653 chunks. Now they have divided this 653 chunks into two parts, training and testing. Even though they follow, in the division, the background information will be there for sure. So this is also one type of a scene dependent strategy. So none of the others is going to claim that this is one type of a scene dependency, but this is one type of a scene dependency because training data directly or indirectly is available in the testing time also. So for more details about uh, this uh, network also, you can verify this particular paper. I think this paper is uh, got accepted in ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems, ITP Transportation Intelligent Transportation Systems. So more details you can verify this now comes to this particular thing as i told you that what the reviewers are doing is scene dependency why this particular con why this particular scene dependency came because once the stuff people started working on this change with the cnn model the people focusing on the accuracies to improve the accuracies to beat other persons they followed these particular concepts of change detection the scene dependency but uh, but we against to this particular strategy then therefore to prove that scene independence is matters it took it took 
two two years for us to convince the reviewers. Let's see this particular concept of scene independency here. As I told you, scene independency matters. An empirical study of scene dependent and scene independent evaluation for CNN based strain detection. This entire research article is trying to prove the scene independence is only a real time approach and this should this is what we should follow for the concept of change reduction because of some of the laggings the more details about this uh, detailed descriptions you can able to find through this particular article but i'll give you the brief concepts of everything so for this particular scene independence whenever you are trying to prove some concept is uh, wrong then we need to prove mathematically also and experimental wise also and at the same time, the network should also be a robust to solve these particular concepts, right? To prove the things are wrong, this is the network which we have proposed. First one is it should be lightweight. Second one is it should be so robust so that it can able to handle the unseen videos. And at the same time, this network should outperform on the scene dependent strategies as well. Because we are climbing on the scene independent, these three things should be very important. It should be mandatory by keeping these three we, we developed one uh, particular network you can able to see it here the network name is change rate network change detection network initially 50 frames this entire concept of this uh, is inspired from the conventional view uh, inspired from the traditional approaches only the concepts are from traditional approaches so they are real time it should be also real time let's see this Initially, we have taken a 50 frames, initially 50 frames. From this 50 frames, we are calculating background. We are estimating a background with the help of DRBE block. So DRBE means depth reductionistic background estimation. So we have proposed one DRBE block that is called, we need to estimate a background. Background is a single frame. Initially, I have taken 50 frames. I need to estimate a single frame. How we can able to estimate this background? For that, we have used this depth reduction stick because I need to reduce the temporal depth as well. So this is completely 2D CNN based concept. So for that, we have used a multi-scale operation that is called MMSR. Here the concept of MMSR that is called multi-spatial receptive features. What is meant by this multi-spatial receptive features? Here we have used one class one convolutions. Three cross three convolutions and five cross three convolutions. From a input in, uh, for, from a input uh, fifty frames, we have applied one cross one convolutions, three cross three, five cross three in temporal manner. You got three responses here. I hope you can able to see the. Yeah, you can able to see it here. So here one class one, three class three, five class one, five class one. Out of these three, the things we have not combined here, concatenated. Here, out of one class one, three class three, or five class three, where whichever the pixel is having a maximum variations, we have identified first. That is called max out of these three responses we have considered. Then generated a response. The same operation of MMSR we repeated twice. So that the temporal depth can be finally reduced. So here we have extracted the maximum information. And if you can able to observe here also, from a given input image, because we need to check whether the salience information are there or not. Because once you have estimated the background, that's fine. But you have to take the differences between the current frame also, right? So from a given input, directly passing a given input, we have extracted the same features here also. Same MMS, same MMSR responses we have extracted here. Then we concatenated this uh, CFA and we concatenated this DRB block and put image. So what about this? This is a temporal median as an extra feature we have added. We can remove this also, and we have removed and we have we have shown the results also. But this is overall overall uh, network. So temporal median why we have given because at that particular location we can able to show what type of a background it is there so that it can able to learn the net the network is really able to able to learn easily able to learn what the background is in cfa block we have concatenated all the background for uh, input image and temporal median and these three information we have passed it to the encoder decoder the same side is of encoder decoder whatever you have used in the literature same thing then we have followed the foreground 
but the question here is network is fine how we need to prove it is a working for the real time is a question right if you can able to observe here this particular 50 frames initially 1 to 50 is also going to be updated second time onwards it is from 2 to 51 third time it is 3 to 52 and so on similarly like a traditional approaches here the inputs are going to be vary with respect to the as, a, as frames goes on, as the time goes on the frames are going to be updated so input is going to be changed this was a major contribution now second second thing you can able to see it here the multi scale feature responses we have extracted a different at a various scales we have extracted the features and at the end we have calculated the background now the question here is you can able to see it here in multi scale what type of responses you can, you, you finally got it so we can able to see this thing through visualization here initially temporal history frames as i told you here the first MMSR block, multi scale receptive fields, first response, second response, and third response. So you can able to see when it when it is reaches to the third, you can able to see the background here. here there are some of the uh, changes in the foreground, but you can able to see it here. Almost the information has lost, only the background is estimated. And for that, we have a frame. Again, we have done the three uh, MMSR block. So that the features can be extracted, we call uh, contemporary features we have extracted. Then the temporal median we have. Is there any other architecture used in place of MOD? In 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 MOD means, yeah, there are many architectures. Uh, till now we have this is the third architecture we are discussing. Yes, we can follow it. We will we will see that also. In this temporal median also we are going to pass it. So, I'm able to see it here. MMSR block. This is called. Uh, a DRB block estimator, you have estimated the background only. So, this is what the target is. We need to estimate the background. How is the question? And this will going to work on the real time. Just every time for each and every pixel, each and every frame, it will going to check whether the given frame input given frame is having a foreground or not. This is a this is a uh, interesting observation in this particular paper. Now the question here is proper data divisions in the literature if you can able to see the data divisions researchers simply will say that we have done the 80 20 percentage of data division but nobody will going to say that which particular frame they have considered for the training and what are the frames they have considered for the testing so the clearly they will not mention so but in this particular paper if you can able to see the clear data divisions were there which particular part will be for the training and what are the things will be for the testing you can able to see here these are all the papers you can able to see it here how many of the papers have used the scene independent evaluation all the conventional approaches are going to be scene independent substance is a scene independent as i told you already but all deep learning approaches you can able to see it here many deep learning approaches they followed the scene dependent only they are not following a scene independent therefore their results will be better now how you can able to prove Something, some network you can able to develop and you can able to show the results are better. It's not like that. So you have to prove the network capabilities in the C independent strategy also. So in the C independent also we have divided the data. So here are two different strategies we have, uh, we have adopted here. One is leave one video out strategy. The C independent evaluation. The leave, leave one video out strategy we have used. That means let's assume uh, one category is having four videos one category you drop for the testing and three categories you put it in the training <clears throat> so training will be on the different set of videos and testing will be on the different set of videos this is for leave video one leave one video out strategy another one is complete video that means let's assume you have a 10 categories each category having four images that means total 40 images are there from a each category, three categories will be uh, from each category, three videos will be on the training and one video on the testing. If you split all the testing, how many testing videos are there? 10, 10 testing videos are there. So here the evaluation can be done in two different ways. One is each category wise, also we can evaluate because each category is working independently. Our complete data also can be considered for the training. I mean, the 30 videos can be considered for the training and left out of the 10 videos can be considered for the testing. 
So whenever you will going to do that category wise, the performance will be better as compared to the complete because complete means you will have the more number of challenges. So the overall accuracy may going to reduce, but it will be more robust for the new data testing. Similarly, the similar strategy for followed for the scene dependent evaluation also. So one is a category wise training and another one is complete data set training. Category wise training, as I already told you, for each and every category, for example, the bad weather condition you can consider. Bad weather category will have the four videos. Three videos will be considered for the training, and one video will be for the testing. So, which particular video used for the testing and training? We have clearly mentioned this particular paper. You can able to, if anybody interested, you can refer this particular paper. Complete data set is more complex. Now, similar strategy again we followed for the scene dependent evaluation because we need to prove scene as compared to scene uh, independent. Scene dependent will be little biased, so accuracy will be. Definitely, it will going to boost. How you can able to prove this? So, on the same network, we have implemented on the dependent also. So, for that, we need to divide the data. Similarly, here also we have divided the data in the category wise and the complete wise. So what is meant by category wise? The concept is so simple. Let's assume you have a thousand frames are there. Here, the data division of scene dependent is so simple. First 50 frames, first 50 frames of a particular video sent for the training. And the rest of the frames you can consider for the testing. So simple. 500 frames, initial 500 frames you can consider for the training, remaining 500 frames for the testing. If you selectively select the frames, it may increase the accuracy. That is not a correct, right? So clearly we have divided this training and testing. And the similar thing for the entire the category wise, you can combine so that the complete data set can be also found. As I told you that the, the more details about this in detail, the you can able to verify. These are some of the training. Initially, we have trained the uh, learning rate of 0 0.006. Later, after some epochs, we have uh, reduced the training by 0 0.002. This is the adaptive learning rate you can consider. So these are all the these are all, you can able to see these are all the different different uh, um, for the different different data sets. These are all the losses. As the epoch chain uh, goes on, the losses are going to vary from different data sets to data set. And these are all the uh, clear uh, what we can say. These, these are all the resultant responses in scene dependent. You can able to see these are all the scene dependent results. Yeah, there are two different type of uh, dependencies are there in the literature. One is 54th and 50 percent. Another thing is 50 percent of the data they used to tra train. But testing they used to done on the all the frames. That means for example, let's assume thousand frames are there, five hundred frames selectively they have selected and they train the model. But during the testing, they will going to test on the all the frames. That means all thousand frames they should test. That means fifty percent accuracy is guaranteed. So there are some research articles are there. So to mimic the same style, we also followed the same thing like uh, follow the entire testing data for the testing and follow the data division strategies how you consider some data how you consider how you consider some data for validation so in this particular uh, cnn model we have not divided any data for the validation not even required in this particular concept we have used the batch size one that's it because already we, we are dividing the data for the training and testing so we, we didn't divide for that data for the validation Bad says two also we can use, but in this example, as it's for the real time, every if it has to take addition for each and every frame, we have considered the batch size one only. So it will take little time for the uh, for the uh, training the model, but it will give better accuracy. So two different way of uh, uh, scene dependent strategies we have followed to show the efficacies to compare with the literature. Now you can able to see this as scene independent data divisions. For the scene independent data divisions, there are some articles which are not even followed, the very, very limited papers which are followed the scene uh, independent uh, evaluation. There are also some biases are there. But if you can able to see the accuracies here in the scene independent also, or uh, the, I mean, this proposed algorithm for category wise and complete is also outperformed. Because the way we have extracted the um, uh, the way we have extracted the background from the multi scale features and the same multi scale features we have passed on the input also. But for the ablation study, 
we follow we followed the similar things like without pass without uh, extracting these multi scale features how the performance will be there without uh, extracting the features from a given input image what will going to happen without passing this uh, temporal median as an input to the network what will going to happen these all uh, uh, things studied in the ablation study you can uh, go through this Do motion detection algorithms are applicable for the tampered videos for tampered frames detection? Yes, definitely yes. Some of the frames have tampered. Depending upon what type of a tampering we can apply. We'll we'll I'll going to show this particular concept of change detection in different uh, application also. We'll going to discuss that also. Yeah, these are all the some of the things. So in different different data because uh, change detection in change detection we need to test on this uh, uh, last year data set all the resistors expecting so last year cdnet and uh, sbmi these are all the data sets which are required to compare to show your efficacy yeah you can able to see it here these are all the ablation studies as i told you that different different set of ablations you can able to say somewhere mmsr blocks completely we can remove the mmsr block what will be the performance the results will going to be down and somewhere you can able to uh, this guy is, is an input image somewhere you don't need to pass then what will going to happen mean is mean temporal median if you're not going to pass what will going to happen and so on so you can able to check all the ablation studies here and to check the uh, efficacy we have done the cross data evaluation also cross data means you have trained the model in one data set, but you have tested on the some different data set. So this is for the F score comparison in PTIS data set. So they have tested the models on the PTIS data set, but trained on some different data set. So you can able to compare these uh, parameters also. If you can able to see the parameters and uh, speed, the, the proposed algorithm is very lightweight. So that it is it is going to operating at 58 frames per second. This particular variance are checking the GPU. And here the number of parameters which we have is used is only 0.13. Only 0.13 million parameters have used for developing this particular network. So as I told you that scene dependent for any data set, if you can able to see with respect to accuracies, scene dependent will always perform better independent will always perform better than 90 percent but comes to the scene independent uh, different different data sets now we have actually only 55 something and maximum 80 or 82 so there is a scope to enhance but for the scene independent data evaluation i'm talking about the scene independent data evaluation so there is scope for improving the accuracy in the scene independent evaluation these are some of the results now by keeping these things in mind with respect to because we need to calculate the y f score because we need to calculate the performances so precision and recall we need to calculate with respect to the ground truth right because here we are trying to take the decision based on the pixel wise so precision you need to calculate and recall also we need to calculate right so if you can able to consider the f score the precision and recall will be both will be there now we can uh, extend this concept to this 3d cd because uh, Scene independent is again our main strategy, but here the network, how the networks are going to play a very significant role in this particular entire thing. In the previous concept, we have used a temporal um, median as an input. I suppose it will going to play a role, but that is a 2D concept. Here the 3D concept we have used, 3D CNN model. Yeah. This is a complete flow of this uh, network. You can able to see it here. There are a number of frames, 50 frames you can consider. From the 50 frames, we are calculating this, uh, it is called background model. So here the name is GRBA, same name. And FSR, foreground saliency representation because I need to calculate the motion changes, then encoder, decoder, and CFD, foreground detection. But the way the strategies are applied was a little different. Let's see here. Because the concepts of 2D CNN models are completely different than the 3D CNN models. 
because in the in the 2D CNN models, the poolings are happening with the on a spatial, like on a if you can apply the max pooling operations in the spatial, the the dimensions are reducing. But it is a temporal. We need to go for the temporal pooling. So temporal pooling means we I'm feeding a 50 frames here. You can here you can able to see it here. 52 class H class W class 50. H is the is heightened width. In the depth is 50 here. Of course, we are concerned. We converted this data into grayscale. We, uh, height, width, height. The M is the filters, height, width, and channel. The channel is grayscale one. So if you can you can able to see it here. So 32 filters we need to apply initially for the 50 frames. So whenever you are applying a 32 filters on a 50 frames, you again got the you will want to generate the response of 32 only, but here the temporal depth is again 50. Now I need to reduce the temporal depth. So I need to reduce the temporal depth. So for that, what we have to do here in the second second uh, level, first convolution is over. In the second level, the temporal stride because to reduce the depth, the op option is max pooling. But in the literature, you knew this as compared to the max pooling, the Convolution with stride, stride two, three, four are going to play and will will be definitely will go to uh, enhance the res results because convolution is a learnable parameters. Max pooling operations are not le learnable parameters. They are, they are not going to learn. Yeah. So now I need to reduce the temporal depth because 50 frames I need to convert into single frame. How we can able to do that? In the second convolution operation, in the second convolution operation, we have used a stride five. So 50 frames, I, we have used a stride five in a temporal manner. So whenever you're going to use a stride five, the 50 frames is come down to 10 frames. But in the spatial, the 32 filters are remains there. I hope you are able to get right. In the temporal side, suppose RGB is there. Um, in 2D, what we used to do? RGB responses are there. One filter is applied. So the three filters are applying on R, G, and B. The values are going to be summed up here. The values are going to be summed up and generating a single frame. Right? But here in the temporal, the concept is a little different. In the 3D convolution, the concept is a little different. So to reduce the dimensionality, we have used a stride called five here. The temporal depth stride is five. Now later use the 16 filters only by maintaining the uh, temporal depth is 10 to reduce the filters later against stride to have used so that the total number of frames comes to down to five maintain the frames but number of filters we have reduced this time eight later on stride five again we have used because i need to come up with a single frame because i need to assume the background only single frame is required for the 50 frames so after this we have used a Side five, the five frames generated a single frame. So you can able to see it here. Total number of spatial filters are remain same. Here the filters are uh, five, eight, same number of filters we are using, but here the stride five we have used so that single frame is generated. So once it is comes to the single frame, my my depth has reduced to one frame by considering the temporal information. But I, my target is a single frame because that is a estimated background. So now the convolution operation we are applying is one. So one cross H cross W cross one. H cross W is the image size you can consider. One cross image size cross one we have applied. So that a single frame is generated. If you can able to observe here, now you see. Single frame background is estimated. Now estimated background. Now what we need to do? Now I need to pass the Input because salience maps, I need to motion saliency is important. That is called coarse motion features. So I need to identify the course, wherever the motions are there, changes are there, I need to identify. <clears throat> to do that, in this in this entire paper, nowhere the handcrafted approaches were involved. So everything is done through an end-to-end -to -end manner. So you can able to consider here this is an image. On this image, we are applying some convolution operations. In the CMF, I'll show you the CMF concept uh, block later. And here the ED is the estimated background. These two are subtracted because 
instead of making a background and the current frame you can able to subtract so that you can get the cmf that is motion salience you can able to get it that's the salience map you can able to get it suppose if you simply pass this motion saliency you can able to see whenever you're trying to do a subtraction between the two things you will get the motions but at the same time you will get the unwanted information also right that is that is the reason the traditional approaches there are other strategies are there to remove this some thresholding concept they used to neglect the unwanted information right here also the same problem will come because whenever you simply try to uh, subtracting this uh, motion salience um, subtracting this uh, estimate value of the current frame you will get the foreground information but you will also will going to get some extra information so we need to remove so therefore only motion saliency can be captured to do that on the response we have done some convolution operations this is a 3d convolution again we have it done with an with an activation function that is called RELU. then features you have generated so these are all the fine-tuned responses you can consider similarly on a given input image on a given input image you have uh, done the same convolution operation with the 3d convolution with uh, activation functions and these two features are concatenated before feeding to the encoder decoder network so here you, you got the inputs input frame the current frame and this is the background estimated these are all fine-tuned and feed it to the encoder decoder you may can ask why you need to pass this because whenever you're trying to do a convolution operation on an input image you will going to get the features right and those features, the foreground information, the assumption the foreground information will going to help us this particular saliency operations so that the more foreground information can be captured and the background can be subtracted. That is what the intuition. To that, we concatenated these two concepts here together and pass it to encoder decoder. So here the encoder decoder is MSC. This is called multi schematic encoder and multi schematic decoder. If you see the encoder decoder concept in the previous uh, layers or in the previous networks and the previous uh, previous uh, in the literature, they simply use a simple encoder decoder concept. <laughs> but here in the encoder decoder itself, also we have used the multi scale responses. This multi scale will going to help us to calculate different type of features here. So in the encoder as well as in the decoder, we have maintained these multi scale features. You can able to see it here in as shown in figure. So these multi multi scale features with different convolutions and activation functions you can able to see it here we clearly mention here once the encoder is over we have adopted the concept of rc that is called recurrence convolution or residual block you can simply consider the residual block concept we have used so that the previous information can be old the information should not last so residual connections we have used then we have passed to the decoder so once the decoder same concept of as a decoder also we have used multi-scale in some of the articles you can able to see the multi-scale used only in the encoder side not in the decoder side but here we have used this encoder and decoder in the multi-scale responses once the features you got he these features are completely forward informations were there because we need to get the foreground but before calculating the forward estimation again we have used the some convolution operations if anything is missed out, it will going to be neglected. To do that, <coughs> some convolution operations we have adopted here or we have used here in the convolution 3D with the, some activation functions, sigma functions. So this is a visual representation of uh, visualization of the different blocks in the proposed network. So GRBE block, so you can able to see this is a temporal history frame, this is a current frame. There are the objects, yes, right? So here in the GRBE block, you can see this. I'll show you this. In the GRB blocks, you can able to see here the, for the background information is only there, the foreground information is not there. This is what we need, right? So we have learned the background. It is not about the feeding the background and the, to support the network to learn the background. So the, it itself is going to learn the background. So why we need to go for this CMF? I told you, right? Because once you are trying to separate the current frame versus the background estimated. You can see you can able to see this foreground information here. Backgrounds also there, and foreground is also there. You can clearly able to observe. So the network you are trying to feed in this information so that it can able to learn. Properly, it can able to learn.
So now these informations have next passed to the encoder decoder. So encoder decoder so that uh, foreground saliency responses can be generated. So once this is over, now we are passing to CFD. As I told you that this information you can able to see some of the backgrounds are there here. Those also can be removed this CFD, the extra convolution operation, whatever you have done. Then you can able to compare with them. Then you can able to do the post processing to get the foreground object. Again, this particular concept has implemented on the same strategy as I told you that scene independent evaluation, scene independent evaluation. So you we have done very extensive experiments. There are many number of experiments are there. The more details about this, you can uh, refer this data division strategies and everything. You can, uh, if you want to know the more details, you can refer this particular paper. Each and everything is crisp and clear. We have explained. These are some of the results in various data sets. CDNet data set, last year's uh, SIE, and the dependent independent evaluation. There are four different experiments, as I told you. Dependent two experiments, independent two experiments, cross different experiments. There are five different type, type of experimental strategies we have shown here in both the papers. But our different artists are some different different algorithms. These are the results you can able to see. The, the detailed ablations were also there. You can verify this particular paper. Here, the number of parameters also very limited here. Is, uh, Number of parameters are only 0.13 parameters, and the frame rate is also more 25 because we are using a 3D, so it will be a little slower. Now, this is the first paper before these two papers. This is a 3D FR. This is the concept also uh, inserted from the 2D concepts. Here also the concepts are a little same as compared to the other paper, but the strategies are a little different here. So this paper I'm not going to discuss. You can go through this particular 3D FR. This is a signal processing letters concept. But here it doesn't have more experimental experimentations and all. This is a concept, simply the concept and uh, importance. That's it. You can able to see the uh, things through this particular paper. Now comes to this new new concept that is called MOR, moving object recognition. In the literature, okay, as of now, anybody question, anybody having any questions as of now for the change detection? This is extension of change detection in different manner. Complexity of frame processing calculated is end to end execution of code. Yes. This is what the testing we will going to calculate the frame, frame rate. Not on the training, testing. How fast your algorithm is. Why of course I uh, okay we'll discuss. Any other questions on as of now? Cross why cross validation is considered? Okay. Okay. Let's see. You have trained a model on cross validation we consider, no? Why it is not considered? Have you considered some uh, data for validation? I told you already this. Why cross validation is considered? Yeah, I am that I'm telling that. Let's assume you have a trained model on indoor. The person you have seen on the sofa, right? Let's assume the the the, the people were uh, on indoor data, you have trained the model, but in the outside, you are going to test on the traffic data. So traffic data and indoor data is no relation at all, right? Let's assume let's assume you have a data set because here the data set of CDNet uh, 2014 data set, the challenges are different. Last year, PTZ, the challenges are different. So I have trained on the CDNet, but I'm testing the data with the PTZ. So the PTZ data is not at all involved in the training procedure. In situation, how your algorithm is performing? So how robust your algorithm for the real-time applications is the challenge. That is how, that is the reason we are. Uh, uh, using this cross data evaluation for uh, easy understanding i will uh, let, let's see this in this example for face recognition you can consider if you if you train a model on a chinese faces but you are testing on indian faces there are two different things na? chinese faces all look similar but indian faces you know the differences right but you're training you have trained the model on the chinese faces and testing model on indian indian data set if you got the better accuracy it's a perfect model or vice versa. 
training on Indian faces, but testing on Chinese faces, you will get the better better results. Then it's perfect. So that is what cross validation, cross data set validation. What is the difference between uh, identity path and the residual path? I don't know what is the meaning of identity and residual path means what? You're talking about uh, residuality. How should objects are detected under a climate situation? Yes, to remove the shadow, shadow objects only we are going to develop this uh, multi-scale responses and the various convolutions, right? Because I'm, our main focusing on the foreground, that means wherever the rate of change of change is more, you try to pick those things and that's how things you can consider as a background. So shadow is also one type of a noise, right? That is the reason we are using a number of multi-scale responses and the convolutions wherever is required. We are using this. That is what we are trying to do to remove the such type of data only. Is there any other question? I don't, I, I didn't understand this question of identity path and residual path. The same question you have raised twice. How many parameters used used do you use mean trainable parameters in complexity calculation? Yes, you're right. How many number of parameters are required during the training is only important. How about the time complexity for moving object detection compared to the normal object detection? So there's a lot of difference. Normal object detection, I'll going to show that. Normal object detection is every frame ways you are trying to detect an object. So there the decision is on a frame. But moving object is, is it, it is a collect it is a decision on collection of frames. You have to consider time series somehow. So obviously that moving object detection will be a little slower as compared to simple object detection. How about the time complex? Okay. I'm talking about the resonant in CN and nature both residual paths and yeah, that's what I'm the residuality means. Previous information you can able to hold it because whenever you go in a deeper manner, the information are going to be lost. Suppose face is there. If you keep on repeating the operation one after other, one after other, whenever you're going to reach to the end, the information is going to be lost. How you can able to preserve to in order to preserve is the previous information you have to concatenate or add so that information can be hold till the end. That is the intention. Sir, F score, I already told you. Now let's come to the if there are questions again we will discuss our content. Now let's come to the moving object recognition. Till now we have done the object uh, object detection, right? Detection we have done, not the recognition. So these concepts are now current concepts are there on the object detection or moving object detection because object detection is also there very popular techniques YOLO, ResNet, uh, RCN, and first RCN, and SSD, and so on, written and written all. Moving object detection, which we have already shown just now. So we have proposed one simple different type of a concept that is called MBO or moving object. This is not a move um, object tracking, this is not a moving object detection, it is a moving object recognition, detection plus recognition. So the concepts which I have inspired from the object recognition and moving object detection. So combining these two is MBO R. With the help of Single stage deep learning framework. The main concept of this one is simultaneously localization and the classification of moving objects in a video. This is called MOR. It's a, this is the first item we have made. And uh, these concepts got accepted in uh, WCV and AC Triple M. I'll go to see the, what the actual differences are. Let's see the difference. Let's see this particular image here. This is a video sequence. If you go for the object detection, this is, a, this is the object detection. What is the object is there, person is there. So you, are, you can able to recognize them. You can be detect the objects, you can able to recognize them. In moving object detection, this is a pixel is binary segmentation you can use so that you can able to solve the problem, moving object detection. This is moving object recognition. Here we are not going to use this pixel based segmentation. Here we are going to recognizing the only moving objects through bounding box concept. What is so important in this? We'll see. We'll see that. I think there will be some demo. 
at the end of the end of the lectures i'll show you some demo so here the question here is you should not recognize the st static objects you have to only recognize the moving object that means this is somewhat the concept of change detection versus object recognition right these two to be used why we need to solve the problem what is the motivation to do this now till now what are the concepts we have shown we have developed a network on a dedicated data sets change rate ptz subsense and so on why because we have a dedicated pixel based uh, pixel based segmentation based ground truth we have already the binary uh, binary images as a ground truth is already available how to generate that it is a very tedious task it is a very complex task to so generating a ground truth itself is a big task so if you want to develop a solution for the new application you also need to develop a ground truth it's very difficult to generate such type of a ground truth but by inspiring from the object recognition concepts of yolo retina and so on we can generate a ground truth with the help of bounding boxes so generating bounding box based ground truths are easier as compared to that binary segmentation based uh, ground truth generation therefore there is a scope in this particular type of uh, bounding box based ground truths but the this type of ground truths are only available in the object recognition but not on the video not for the moving objects so what to do so in, inspired from that we have uh, developed one uh, new set of ground truths on the cdnet data set because if i if we can prove anything the secondary issue but cdnet is one of the popular uh, data set which is publicly available and from many years that most of the researchers are following this cdnet data set right so by keeping this as a reference we generated bounding box that is the access aligned based bounding box labels we have generated so we annotated access aligned bounding boxes there are uh, 42000 something objects are there out of which 15000 are cars and 27000 are persons so here i here as a trial purpose we have considered only two classes that is called uh, cars and persons so we have considered these many number of videos from the data set why to do this because for this type of application is not at all available and such type of bonding boxes on the videos are not there that is the reason we have generated such type of a labels so this is a complete data division what type of uh, data divisions are uh, how many number of frames we have considered how many number of cars how many number of things everything is clearly mentioned on this particular paper so if you anybody wish you can uh, go through this particular paper this is the first paper that's called motion drag a unified deep framework for moving object recognition so you can able to see from here some concepts of object recognition you can able to see some concepts of change reduction you can able to see from this particular example from this particular framework so here you can able to see as i told you as it is the first attempt we have considered these 50 frames from this particular frames we have done this uh, uh, temporal distance uh, block and we have faded this temporal median and the current frame you can able to see it here in this particular resonate concept sorry retina net concept sorry retina net concept there is a concept called backbone model here this is called resonate resonate 50 so in the retina net the researchers have used the resonant 50 as a backbone model so if you can observe in this particular strategy we also have used the resonant 50 only but here the background model whatever you have estimated is concatenated with the temporal median you can neglect this also of course in the it is this is there in the ablation so the recent 50 models we have estimated the background and this background you have passed it to backbone model and you got the backbone features only for the background you pass it to the resonant 50 then you got some features that is called backbone features for the background similarly for the input current frame also we have passed it to the backbone model that is called resonant 50 from there you have extracted the different type of uh, features on an input image because i need the foreground right because this background will going to help me for the regression problem for the background estimation as well as the location identification but this is a current frame we are passing to the framework because to identify the object 
to look at the object to identify the object we are passing this current frame to the backbone model and now these two frames you can able to see it here those, these two responses you can able to see it here these two responses the, uh, back, background and foreground information we have concatenated and passing to the multi-level feature pyramid in the retina net you can able to see this multi-level feature pyramid so here the main object here is we need to calculate the regression and classification losses but the classification is going to support the object class regression is going to say saying about the probability of its location so now what is this multi pyramidal feature multi-level feature pyramid if you can clearly able to see this particular retina net concept here from this particular residual that is a backbone model they are passing this information to this multi-level pyramidal structure that means they are using multi scales let's assume i'll i'll, I'll uh, tell you the detailed scales at each and every layer you can able to see here i'll i'll come back to the slide again here you can able to see this is a multi-level uh, feature pyramid here p3 p4 to p3 to p7 there are uh, five levels are there this is the multi levels five levels are there so in the retina net if you can able to see the levels the sizes are clearly mentioned it at what type of scale they have used for example in the p7 that is called the uh, here you can able to generate an output of 5 cross 5 only very small so multi scale very small at a uh, six, uh, sixth level you can able to go for the 10 cross 10 at the fourth level you can go for the 38 cross 38 and uh, third level you can go for the 76 cross 76 so each and every level then that means the input given data they have reduced to different different scales and there they are analyzing what was the purpose of doing this at each and every level they are calculating this regression classification losses that means here the algorithm is running for five times why you can able to analyze this particular problem clearly the object size can be very smaller or very bigger right so the probability of presenting the object in a one particular bounding box may lies in one of these particular levels right so in which level this particular in, 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 in which particular level the maximum intersection of union is happening is only the major concern to do that in the researchers have used multiple scales this is called multi-level pyramidal structure they have adopted so we also have used the same similar structure to solve such as this particular problem you can able to see this here as i told you this uh, tdr block <clears throat> So then we have done this regression and the classification losses here. To do that, take the multiple frames, estimate the background we have already discussed, the similar strategy we have all followed here. Here the simplest strategy we have followed here. And here you can able to see from these images that uh, uh, background is estimated. The information is passed, so you can able to see it here. In a multi scales, you can able to see some of the scales we have seen. One, two, three, four, four scale we have shown here. Three to three, six. So you see here, the uh, the foreground information is going to hold here you can able to see so at each and every size, depending upon the sizes here the bounding box is very small here, a little bigger here, different size so here you have different different bounding boxes are there because different objects will have the different different bounding boxes how you can able to um, identify in which bounding box the object is located to do this this but the multi parameter structure concept will going to help us this is a proper visualization you can able to see it here and as i told you this is the first attempt of mor there is no uh, e e techniques were exist so th these are all the baseline results which we have developed on this particular uh, approach on this particular uh, ground truths so by implementing this uh, retina net in 3d style mobile net again this in this model and more uh, more version one and more version two you can able to see it here in we have done the evaluations and you can able to see the results here so as i told you without passing input also we have tested the results are little down as compared to passing input because we need to pass input because from there you will going to get the objects for if you will pass input from there you will going to get the object shape and structure so that network can able to easily learn and these are all the different parameters because if you see input if i am not passing input uh, initially i have passed the input and background model uh, the model size is very big because you are passing to resnet 50 right resnet 50 is already 
uh, deeper networks. So pretend means we have used. But whenever you are, uh, whenever we have removed this particular uh, input to the backbone model, the half of the parameters have reduced. But it will give a little lesser recognition accuracy as compared to the passing input to the network. Now this is a different way of uh, an analysis of IOU intersection of unit. How you can able to consider what is the intersection of unit? Fifty percent of the intersection of unit you are considering for the object presence or not is matters. So if you can go for the uh, twenty percent of intersection. Okay, if you can able to see this IOV ratio is only 20%, that means 20% overlap is there, you can consider as a presence. That means there is a high chances of getting an accuracy. But if you go for the 100% of precision, that means 100% you have to match the object ratio and uh, the ground truth should match 100%. Then the recognition accuracy will going to be re reduced. So from the literature, you can able to see it here. Everyone going to, from the literature, the object recognition, they will use the 50 percent IOU. So to show the efficacies at a different different uh, categories, you can able to see it here. 20 percent of uh, IOU, then you will get the better accuracies. But 100 percent of IOU, you will get the minimum accuracy. So if you if you compromise on the precision, you will get the recall. Recall uh, you, will, you will not compromise on the precision. 100 percent precision you will expect. Recall will go to down. These are all the different evaluation studies. This is what I'm trying to talk about. So you can able to see it here. No, the vehicle has stopped. So you observe here. So here you the vehicle wherever the vehicle is moving, the bounding box is there. Whenever this particular vehicle, whenever this particular vehicle is stopped. Of this entire thing, whenever this vehicle is stopped, the bounding box is gone because my interest is on the moving objects, not on the static. So here also you can able to see. So these are some set of samples. You can uh, the more details you can able to see. Now this is the concept which we have applied for the conventional views to prove the efficacy. But the same strategy we have applied for the aerial view. So if you want to if you want to do the same problem for the aerial view, as I told you, the challenge is something different. Let's see this. See here is a regular view. See, this is a scene. You will going to get the maximum size of the object size is very bigger. So you will get the more number of properties here to describe an object. But comes to a aerial view, the size of the object is very small. And even very dense objects are there. N number of objects are there in a single frame. So how you can able to apply an algorithm which can solve these two is a challenging question. So while you are applying any of the model on the UAVs, UAV base, then some of the things we need to consider. That is the memory we need to consider. And comp uh, computer uh, complexity is also computation complexity is also important. And accuracy is also important. How much it is. Uh, acting to the real time is also important. So while you are developing any of the algorithms, we need to consider these are the things in our mind. So as we want to work on this serial data set, the time we have started, there is no such type of uh, uh, data sets are available. Later, there are many are available. So we have prepared one particular data set that is called ABD, airborne data set. So here in the airborne data sets, you can consider we have uh, collected uh, 2000 uh, aerial images with the permissions from the agencies, which is available in the publicly available domains, but we have uh, taken the concerns from the companies. There are some many drone companies are uh, freely make uh, their data available. So we, we took the concern and we have generated this data set only for the research perspective. In this particular airborne data set, we have uh, annotated 42,408 objects. That means we have annotated 42,000 objects. Now, how many different classes you have considered here? Here we have considered classes of cars, heavy vehicles, and planes, and so on, and boats. So these many number of classes we have classified through the ABD data set. This is all the proper data division. Now we are trying to make it available this data set maybe by next week. The background is already over. Now we are trying to avail, uh, 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 we will try to provide this to public. Now you can able to see these are all the different different challenges. So you can able to see here sample images from the ABD data set, 
see the how the size of the uh, object here is very smaller and here the size of the object is little bigger 20 minutes so here the size of the object is little bigger here the size of the object is very smaller right so these are all the different different challenges we have considered and as i told you that our intention is on uh, there are some solutions on this you can go through these uh, papers and next one is uav more net as i told you bounding box is my concern from a aerial view so for this this is another new data set we have generated because it's a video is required so in the literature we have uh, object tracking data sets and object detection data sets are also there but for moving or matlab object detection is different moving of the detection is different moving of the recognition is different right that too from a aerial view you need to recognize the objects which are moving so the data set such type of for this particular solution there is no data sets are available so we have generated again some set of data sets grade cam concept grade cam i i am not having idea on grade cam sir sorry how to go through it maybe i'll go i'll verify and i'll update you yeah so for this particular thing again a new data set has generated the mor because bounding box is one of the easiest solution of solving the problem for the aerial view in this case as it is a video now the problem again will come here previously we have calculated the uh backgrounds and foregrounds the strategies are not going to work here because again the as the same strategies are not, not going to work here it is going to fail the reason is <clears throat> the object size is very very small how i can able to estimate the background because i will i will have the diverse backgrounds from the aerial view so that particular strategy is not going to work intuition might be same but strategies are good, not going to work here so we have used the concept of temporal cascade optical flow so in this optical flow also initially optical flow will be going to take the difference between the two consecutive frames so here we have done the two consecutive frames at a distance of 3 at a distance of 5 it means the first frame and third frame first frame with the fifth frame and so on like that we have calculated to different uh, uh, to estimate the motion because our in main intention is on the motion so previous concepts will not going to work here we have done we have it is it is giving zero percentage so we have come up with a new strategy that is called optical flow so these optical flow our main intention is to estimate the motions once you have a, got the motions now you pass this to the same backbone model and you calculate the same strategies whatever you have done but here how you can able to handle that that uh, sizes and bounding boxes will going to play a very important role on this particular this is a step where this particular things are going to help us because here also we have considered two classes in this example two classes objects and persons that's it two classes are heavy vehicle and heavy vehicle so two classes are there based on this we can able to train the model so this is again for the inspired from the retinet concepts but the concepts of retinet will not going to work on here so we have make the necessary changes and this particular paper is available in uh, ac triple m if anybody interested you can uh, verify this particular concept and this is a complete data division again i am uh, 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 as we are saying this is a first attempt to solve the problem so baseline results we have generated everything is generated from the scratch existing concepts also we have to develop and uh, propose also because there is nothing is there to compare so this is a complete data divisions you can able to see it here we have generated a huge data set but we have tested for the limited categories only and those categories we have given here and uh, these are all the different uh, strategies m1 u1 version 2 3 and version 4 there are different different uh, applications we have done here to show the efficacies i told you this i intersection of union is important so we have uh, shown the differences different accuracies on different different categories and performance wise you will say this is also some not that much of lightweight this is a little complex because uh, we are going to uh, we have used the concept of uh, optical flow here so little complex so there is a scope for all this and this particular uh, data set also we are trying to make it available to the public and uh, almost code is also available and uh, code is also we are trying to make it available to the public if anybody wish uh, anybody wish to do you can follow this particular uh, website for the code and the data set and so on but of course you have to give the undertaking for the code as well as for the uh, data set 
now comes to the next uh, concept somebody has asked me for anomaly detection i'll cover it very fast anomaly detection the major challenges i will explain here anomaly means something which is not a normal so for the real time situations we will have the normally more we will have the more normal events than the anomalous events so obviously you will have the more collection of normal data than the anomalous data so whenever you are going to handle such type of problem of anomalous detection the data is creating a lot of problem so whenever you are going to apply another deep learning algorithm using the traditional classification approaches it will create a overfitting so how we can able to design a solution how we can able to solve this particular problem in the literature there are different strategies were there the people have used normal data they have trained the models only on the normal data they have tested on the normal and abnormal data so normal data means if your training model is not able to uh, sorry whenever you are going to training on the normal data you your model knows what is the normality whenever you are passing any normal data it will show normal but whenever you are passing abnormal data as the abnormal data is having changes your network will go into identify that is one type of a solution of doing anomalies there are some set of researchers are working on the classification strategies because of one problem that is that real time because in the if you will train the model on the normal data but in the testing again you need the normal data from where you will get the normal data for the real time perspective to maintain this normal data is not feasible of course you will get the solution you can you can provide the solution but for the real time perspective it is a challenging task so again this is a set of researchers are working on the different category called classification so i'll i'll give you a simple uh, simple example this is a very old concept i mean three years back or two years back concept everything is through transfer learning so set of readers is there from video frames initially you can calculate the optical flow and uh, this from video frames we can use the uh, vgc 16 concepts and you can extract the features and from the motion you can able to get, look at the motion net you can pass to the motion net you're going to get the motion features concatenate these two and you can take, take the classification this is also one strategy but it is not that much robust but initially as i, as I told you is a two three years old solution so here this is not a this is a dependent strategy and again then this is a dependent strategy because they, we don't have that solution at the time similarly <laughs> there are some results this is one interesting problem you can able to see um, uh, nvidia has started uh, one challenge in cvpr so the challenge here is they have a given one data set this is what ai city challenge in 2019 from 2019 onwards they are conducting these challenges every year they are increasing the uh, increasing the different different uh, challenges also in this particular ai city challenge now 2021 also there is a the ai city challenge is also there if anybody wish you can try it for this we have a proposed one a time stamp aware anomaly detection solution we have presented and this work was this work was accepted in uh, cfpr workshop now what the challenges here is let's let's see here this is a real real data which is uh, generated by nvidia traffic data traffic data here the what is the anomalous event they have defined the anomalies anomalous event is this is a highway i hope you are able to see here this is a highway the objects are moving slowly on this highway you should not stop if any vehicle is stopping that is anomalous activity so how you can able to identify because the in on a highway you the vehicles can move faster the vehicle can come slower and it is from the longer distance the object size is very small tiny objects so how you can able to generate a model or how you can able to identify there was an anomalous event is is there or not to that we have given some some solution so these are all the some of the data set samples from the nvidia that is called ai city challenge these are all the samples to solve this particular thing we have come up with one solution first one is background modeling first of all we have estimated a background there what are the model is there first you estimate the background from the background you you do the object detection because in the background if the vehicle is on a highway if the vehicle is stopped for some time it will it will comes in a background but as per the highway as per the challenge uh, conditions on a highway there should not be a car to be stopped on a highway so first you estimate a background once you have estimated background then you have to go for the object detection because the size of the object is very small we need to find out some alternative solution the tiny objects the tiny object detection solution needs to be used once it is over now you need to calculate at what instant at which particular instances this particular event has happened because i have a long sequence of video that is called uh, 
one hour video maybe the anomalous event the car may be stopped for 10 seconds or 10 minutes so we can we need to identify what what is the time stamp at what time instant this particular anomalous event was happened so that also we can we can identify this is what the challenge is so for that we have proposed one background estimator model so this is this is a little complex i mean in 2019 this is a little complex model so here we have used n number of uh, deeper encoder decoder network we have generated to estimate the background then object detection algorithm we have used as i told you that as we have done work on the tiny object detection concepts so similar concept we have applied here to detect the tiny objects so here we have again trained the model because here the objects are labels are different because here the car is car is there truck is there there are some different objects so again we have trained the model from the scratch depending upon the requirement and the objects have detected so you can able to see it here you can able to see it here these are all the results what was the limitation of the proposed algorithm see this is the original video i hope you are able to see it here this is the original video on this particular video we have generated a background we can generate the background because we don't have the ground rules here the question here is in this particular challenge we don't have the ground rules so everything whatever you need to do you have to accept the challenge you have to give your own solution so first we generate estimated the background <clears throat> see here there is a small gap between the roads but as it is a tiny object this particular gap is considering as an object it's like a car it was the limitation of this particular proposal algorithm otherwise it can able to solve the most of the problem these are the some of the false false positive results these are the correct results you can able to see it here the background is there background is there if there is nothing was there you can able to see it here in this particular situation none of the vehicles have a stop so your anomalous video detected nothing so that's a correct detection but if your anomalous video is detecting something it was a false detection so this is the limitation of this particular paper there are other solutions also there in the anomalous detection but we are not added yet so in future maybe we will see any other questions as of now i think this is last yeah this is last set any other questions gather satellite images with motion videos having a cyclone eye moment for detection using motion definitely you can able to do that the long term object is this one only but here the different different challenges were there so we need to consider what type of data you have and how we would like to do so based on that we can able to do that yes we can do that any other can we use grad i told you that grad i don't have any idea i will let you know later you can contact me later manik i will i will explain you yes if any other questions are there please so i attended your lecture partly in the beginning and at the end because i had a class and i'm really okay. amazed to see your work you have done excellent work and you are now contributing in terms of uh, data generation that is something very interesting uh, for the research community it is very important to have enough data we are so thankful to you Dr. Santosh Viparthi for your amazing lecture. It was such a wonderful lecture. You covered many things in such a small period of time. And uh, grad cam because uh, there somebody introduced a long back. I mean, I think uh, it was um, I think Dr. Amit Sethi uh, introduced that. That is uh, if. Uh, somebody asked that is basically to be back propagate to identify uh, which pixel positions were responsible or which pixel or which patterns were more responsible for classification of the image into a category right so it is basically we back propagate and check the uh, to through the activation maps 
class activation maps that what were what are where the responsible so it's basically for interpretable ai so um, that is not related to the subject so perhaps uh, that was the reason and yeah. we are so happy uh, thank you ma'am somebody is asking some questions and i want to he has like given it. a very good uh, compliment that i'm really intrigued and overwhelmed by the depth and how every single paper add to the progress towards the novel solution yes and dr santosh vipathi's work is outstanding let me tell you and uh, if you want to know more he is always free to help others so if with this i think we conclude and this was most uh, befitting uh, lecture for as a concluding lecture for this program yeah, <laughs> Thanks for your and today so before we uh, say a goodbye to all the participants uh we welcome you once again for the last time in this program and i wish to just remind you that you have to take one more test that is quiz 2 please note that the time is 30 minutes basically but we extend the time up to 9:40 so it will start dot at 9 we will provide you the link 5 minutes before approximately 5 minutes before 9 please check the google drive i'll try my best to send an email to all of you so that you receive the quiz link but it will be if you don't receive please check the shared google drive where the link will be given so this this uh, chapter this will be mostly on neural network and convolutional neural network this quiz will be so uh, and don't worry we have very simple examples so that we know how much we have been able to deliver so that is only to assess the quality of our program not your understanding okay so with this uh, i invite all of you to the last valedictory session the last session of this program and uh, uh, we have with us today uh, dr somaraju from nit patna dr mukesh kumar from nit patna dr santosh sripathi and me and we have uh, ms punima singh thakur also there are other people who have also helped us in this program let me check if there are other people who are there okay so shall we begin uh, the program now can you give me the right to share so that i would like to tell them about the new programs sure 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 one second yeah so participants before we end we would like to tell you that we are running many programs and sorry just a minute we are many run, uh, we are running many programs and i wish to show you that these are the programs which are upcoming programs uh, just a minute this is coming here so how to do that i am not able to shift it that's the problem with this just a minute please hold on for a while so if you go here joint online programs are there uh, i hope you can see those programs we have upcoming program 5d 5g design journey from device to circuit in which the principal coordinator will be dr gaurav trivedi and joint principal coordinators from each institutions will be there we have ict tools for teaching learning process and institute in which dr bharat gupta will be the principal coordinator from nit patna then we will be and this program is from 15th of march 2021 and the first program is from 1st of march 
Then we have a risk V VLSI implementation. This program is 27th of March. Then we have yet another program, Data Science for All, in which uh, uh, Professor RBV Subramanyam from NIT Warangal will be the principal coordinator. Then we have system design methodologies that will be running from 19th of April. Dr. Gaurav Trivedi is the principal coordinator. And uh, immediately the next week, we have advanced communication and antenna. Professor Ratnajit Bhattacharji is the principal coordinator of the program. You can find the details of these programs in any of the academy's webpage. This is my academy's webpage, but you can find it any academy's webpage. And please uh, keep registering in whatever program you think is important to you and you would like to have. Uh, please uh, spread this news also among your colleagues and students so that others can also take benefit of that. Okay, so now shall we start? Uh, uh, Santosh, I seek the permission of all the members present here. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. So, Dr. Mukesh uh, Kumar, yeah. would you like to say something? We have been both me and Santosh have been talking a lot in this program. Yes. We would yeah. like to listen from you, Dr. Mukesh and Dr. Soma Raju. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. I am Mukesh Kumar from NIT Patna, and uh, we are uh, organizing this FDP. Previous year also, we have the we are the coordinator of this FDP. And I hope that we again meet uh, at next session and be a coordinator of this uh, such an important FDP and try to maximize the number of participants because this FDP is very beneficial for us also to get the knowledge from the experts. Okay. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for giving Thank us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sumaraju, would you like to say a few words? Uh, would you like to address the participants? Yes, madam. Uh, good evening to Professor Aparjita, madam, and Santosh Viparthis, and other panelists, and my dear um, participants. I'm really happy, and also I'm thankful to giving this opportunity to part of this particular uh, workshop, in Machine Learning for Computer Vision. And this workshop, actually, I have uh, gone through the, all the um, lectures. So mostly eminent people has taught uh, each and every co every topic, starting from the stalwart in this computer vision, Professor Santan Chaudhary, director of uh, IIT Jodhpur. And we are also have uh, people from the uh, Fujishi from Japan and uh, Madam uh, Barbara Jitava from the Czech Republic. And also we have people from IIT, uh, Delhi and IIT. Uh, Bombay also, and even um, I have very uh, motivated from the Santosh Vipati uh, lectures also, uh, starting from the he taught uh, regarding the deep learning uh, introduction. I have seen really good uh, introduction and he has given some uh, good explanation comparing to machine learning and, and also the uh, deep learning. Uh, and I'm, I'm really inspired in the lectures also. And I'm really thankful for the uh, uh, ENI City Academies for giving this opportunity to part of this particular uh, course. I'm uh, seeking um, uh, uh, in the future also, uh, I'd like to part in this particular process. And uh, I hope so. Most of the, even uh, from the uh, feedback we have seen from the uh, thoughts of the participants, we really got the positive feedback. Mostly, I have seen. Uh, they have really appreciated each and every speaker uh, from the beginning from the day one to uh, today's last session. And this makes that uh, this workshop is really successful, I hope so. And people have motivated from the uh, people, uh, most of the lectures, and I hope so they will continue the research in these directions. Uh, and I would like to thank to the organizers and the participants. Uh, thank you, madam. So this is from all my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Somaraju. Uh, Dr. Santosh, uh, would you like to say something to the participants? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, really, I need to appreciate the participants' patience and their 
keep on listening the all the lectures and they're giving asking the number of questions that was really attracted us this time because they are in, they're shown their interest they're asking their questions and all so almost all lectures are this time very good and have, they have appreciated all the persons who are happy with the labs and uh, everything so i'm personally i'm also happy on that so personally i would like to say thank to all the each and every participants there are juniors to seniors so for everyone we are i would like to say thanks and in this platform again i would like to thank to oja ma'am for uh, keeping on uh, keeping me in this particular workshop so that we can able to learn many things thank you ma'am thank you so we have become a team i think i don't think uh, we are going to have any any workshop organized without uh, you without dr mukesh kumar without dr soma raju so we have become a good team i think so um, we are also thankful to dr prithvijit guha and dr ame karkare who are the coordinators of this program somehow they could not be present today so on behalf of all the coordinators and all the academies our sincere thanks go to all the participants many of uh, you were having some difficulty or the other you kept on writing to us somehow we, some problems we could solve some we could not so if there's anything that is uh, that could not be fulfilled from our side i hope next time we'll try to improve number one and i am really so thankful to many participants so many participants who have been writing uh, showing their like showing that they are making sincere efforts to learn things and that gives the true motivation to any organizers uh, we feel that without your support without your learning experience uh, no workshop will be successful no program will be so successful and i see that many of you uh, are i mean keep on asking questions if you are not able to take the quiz you are writing to me to santosh ji to everybody to the somaraj ji to mukesh ji so that shows that you are keen to learn and this is not the end let me tell you this is the beginning of our relationship my dear participants and we will continue to Uh, have our discussion you can uh, any time you can talk to us you can uh, write to us so that we can try we will try to solve your problems either with the help of our core team or we can connect you to the right expert okay so don't worry we will be definitely helping you i'm you know, sorry to disturb yeah uh, uh, because uh, my co coordinator is also present satyendra singh chauhan because okay. i am not a host so i was not able to add him now i added him so he so helped me he is my backbone here to support so he is also there uh, sachendra dr sachendra uh, okay yes sir good evening ma'am good evening ma'am good evening satyendra ji very good evening and a warm welcome to you also and thank you so much uh, shailesh ji also thank you so much satyendra ji both of you and dr santosh viparthi you have been uh, so supportive in maintaining uh, the net i mean this uh, entire system so that we could run these programs our sincere thanks go to all the coordinators to all the cis chief investigators of academies and to the ministry of electronics and information technology we are also thankful to each and everybody who directly or indirectly supported us as uh, participants if you have any concern or anything that you want to ask please feel free in asking us but before that let me please uh, request you not to worry about your certificates if you are sa satisfying all the conditions your certificates will be released soon but please give us a week's time i'll try my best we will try our best to get to issue, start issuing certificates from sunday because we have to compile all the data and in case you are not able to get a certificate because of some very small thing don't worry we will try our best to help you get a certificate right because if you have worked well 
you you deserve a certificate somehow many of you were not able to um, attend some sessions so don't worry because uh, you were tra traveling from home to office to college or college to home so if you have not been able to attend a few sessions that's not a problem we have already given you all the lecture uh, you, uh, youtube videos of all the lectures so you can go through them all right anything that you want to say please say then uh, uh, we would like to close the session satendra ji would you like to say something let me begin with you uh, no and thank you for giving uh, such opportunity in the collaboration and all the lectures were wonderful i i attended some of the lectures and they were very good and dr santosh parthiv was amazing there were a lot of paper so we also are grateful to our speakers professor shantanu chaudhary professor fujiyushi professor barbara zetova uh, professor Su suresh sundaram from iit guwahati dr amit sethi from iit bombay dr prithvijit guha from iit guwahati uh, our own colleague dr santosh uh, viparthi from mnit jaipur and uh, our special thanks to our phd scholars monu verma and uh, jagdeep uh, biradar i am huh? biradar is thick now yeah biradar biradar yeah, yeah. kuldeep biradar kuldeep biradar sorry kuldeep biradar um, ms punima singh thakur and mr samir jain for helping us with lab sessions anything uh, if a uh, participant wants to say we will be sending you a feedback form and will be requesting you to please fill out that form so that in future what do we want what do you expect from us and how do, should we run this program the next program on deep learning and applications is going to be in i think june we will announce the date soon and we will seek your participation thank you ma'am okay so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart i sincerely thank my colleagues coordinators and yes this <laughs> quiz is 9 pm today some people are asking you will be getting the registration link for fdps future fdps through our websites please visit our websites whichever academy you wish to register in it can be jabalpur jaipur patna guwahati roorkee whichever i mean kanpur whichever academy you wish to register thank you shall we uh, close the program now with thanks to all the all the people who did it and uh, so we you become the alumni of eict academies and you will ever remain close to us thank you so much thank you so much once again thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you, thank thank you, you to all the participants and the speakers thank you ma'am thank you i'm leaving uh, the event now sure ma'am and uh, santosh ji you have to share the att attendance status yeah thank sure you. sure you. I okay. cannot take the names of all the participants, but we are so happy to be associated with you. Thank you. Shall I close the session, ma'am? The quiz is at nine p.m. Yes, yeah.